Okay, so today we are going to theoretically finish uh, Sanderson's Three Laws, but we're also going to spend a whole lot of time on characterization and viewpoint. That's what I want to dig into today. Um, and we'll probably do that first and then move on to, to get into the other laws if we need to. As I said last week, I really personally consider uh, character to be the most important feature of a story. A story with a fantastic character but a bland setting has a much better chance of succeeding than a story with a fantastic setting and a bland character. Ideally, I want you to learn to do both. Don't get me wrong. I'm not excusing weakness in either area. However, you have all read books and enjoyed books that have a rehash setting that, or story that's not that original. Harry Potter was not an original story. Harry Potter had, a great, um, had great characters. It had excellent execution. But Boy at Wizard School was a, a very common trope in fantasy. She just did it better than anyone else. It's kind of proof that if you, you can take any of these things and do them really well, people will latch on to it. And um, you will find that your readers will respond much better to a really great character than to anything else. Um, like I said, do all three, but great characters. This is going to make your book really feel alive as you kind of practice all of these other things. Uh, what do I mean by a great character? Well, I'll ask you, what is a great character? What, what in your opinion, what makes a great character? Okay, relatable, okay. Relatable, sure. Um, exists beyond the page. This one's dying. Okay, beyond the page. Oh, that's better. What else? Over here. Okay, backstory. Um, you really, your reason is motivation. That's a pretty, pretty important one. Exhibits growth. Growth, okay, has an arc. All right. Admirable. Admirable, okay. Has human flaws as well as okay. Flaws. And sympathetic, you said over here. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, that's a pretty good list. That's also a very challenging list. Your job is to do these things uh, and to bring your characters to life. Your job is creation. You are taking something that is unalive, the page, and you're making it feel alive as if there is somebody there who's real. That's your job. We're going to talk about how to do it. This is all very important stuff. Um, Early in my career, when I was writing books that didn't get published, um, I was dissatisfied with some of my characters. And I came to realize that one of the reasons for this was that I was thinking of them as their role first and who they were second. Um, it became, over the course of my career, a mantra to me, which was mentioned in here, that the character needs to live beyond the page. Specifically for me, I find that a character is more powerful if they have passions and motivations beyond the main plot. Beyond what the main plot would require of them, okay? People like things. We all like things. We're all interested in things. We have things we want to be doing. If today you were thrown into a major um, sort of plot, you have some 20 years of experience behind you, of a life behind you, of things that have happened, for some of us more than that. Um, you, will, you would have been interrupted in your life. And I really, as a, as a writer, look for this sort of interrupted in the life. It's kind of a storytelling maxim that you know, the story happens when whatever the character was planning to have happen in their life gets interrupted. Now, this is slightly a problem because this is the, the basic way to start a story. You have a life, it gets interrupted. The problem with that is the characters then tend to be reactionary. They tend to be passive. Um, and this is another problem you'll run into. It is, is a major problem. You can see it um, most uh, powerfully sometimes in superhero films um, because they tend to follow a very specific 
cycle and they, they, they have a certain trope to them. In a lot of these, the hero would do nothing if there weren't a villain doing interesting things, interrupting their life. This runs you into a problem that you somehow need to make your character proactive. Despite the fact that they're being interrupted. Has anyone read a story where the villain was more interesting than, than the protagonist? This happens because the, the villain tends to be proactive. The villain has plans. The villain has passions. They have things that they're um, about and they're doing. And they have this great thing they want to achieve, they get interrupted by the hero um, you know, running afoul of their plans, and it innately builds this weird sympathy for the villain that is sometimes hard to overcome. You end up having these films that are about the villain rather than about the hero. This is a challenge for you as writers to be aware of that this happens, and it's because of these things. We are attracted as readers to characters who are proactive and who have a passion and who are doing things. All right. Um, we are also attracted to characters who are capable. Uh, okay, wow, capable, yeah, okay, capable. We're attracted to characters who are capable. They, they, are, they excel at what they do. We're also attracted to characters who are sympathetic. That's part of kind of the definition of sympathetic. What it, let's go and dig into that. What does sympathetic mean? What makes a character sympathetic? When the reader is able to feel what the character feels. OK, OK. Um, you empathize with them. So how can you make them uh, the reader empathize with the character? OK, OK. They, they, certainly, it is more easy to build when you have similarities. Similarities, good. Um, but one thing I'd point out here is it's hard to empathize with a character if they feel no emotion. Um, a lot of new writers, it's harder for them to do emotion right. Once in a while, someone just throws emotion all over the page, and it uh, becomes melodrama. More often than not, you're just not writing emotion into your characters. Uh, they, they, this is a function of not being practiced enough at show versus tell, and watching um, a lot of films, and so writing your books cinematically, where you aren't showing the emotions because you can't, you're not skilled enough to show the emotions, which is what a film does, right? It can't tell you the emotions, it has to show them to you. You're not skilled to pull that off yet, so you just don't put it in, which means that your characters become these robots who are fulfilling these action roles as if it were a film, and you never get this empathy because we don't know what they're feeling. Um, we, we start reading the book and say, wow, I, if, you know, if my dog got run over by a truck, I would be feeling this way, but this person just doesn't feel anything. Well, you're trying to write this character that they have like this stoic sense of, you know, I must continue on, um, and you know, they've got a strength inside, though inside they're really hurting, but you don't have the skill yet to pull it off, so you just don't mention it, and then your characters become robots. This is a major problem um, with new writers making um, characters sympathetic is that they just don't have any emotions. Um, going the other way and just telling us how they feel is also not necessarily the best thing to do. Uh, so you run into this catch-22. This one is show versus tell. It's where that comes into play quite a bit. All right. So sympathetic uh, characters usually are also um, flawed. Uh, you were right, whoever brought that up. Um, most really great characters are going to have some sort of flaw. Um, I also put in limitations as different from flaws. Um, and then there's the character arc. Um, so early on, I, I realized I was just sticking people into roles, right? Usually my main character was a little more rounded. All the side characters were incredibly flat. Um, you know, I would have the romantic interest, and she was in the book to be the romantic interest rather than to be a character unto themselves. Um, start thinking about this. Start asking yourself questions about how your character, what your characters would be doing. What would they be doing? What would they be searching for if the main plot of the book didn't hit them? Um, and if the story is really about them and their passion, then ask yourself, what are they beyond their passion? We are all more than one thing. 
Um, you can have you know, the bounty hunter, who's also a stamp collector. Once you start adding in people's real human passions, then suddenly they become way, way more rounded. The bounty hunter who's a stamp collector, you can say that in one sentence, and that character, I can guarantee, just became more rounded in your head in an interesting way than the bounty hunter because the bounty hunter becomes this sort of faceless person who, you know, is whatever. Either you're thinking Star Wars and they wear a helmet, or you, so you can't even see the face, or you're thinking, you know, this gruff person who hunts down the protagonist or whatnot. Adding a few little touches like this, you don't have to go overboard, but adding a few little touches makes the characters come to life. Um, Blade Runner has the, um, the guy that, that makes or origami, right? Anyone seen that film? Um, I mean, that simple thing, making the origami, makes us really sympathize with that character, who's primarily really an antagonist. That makes me think of Tangled when there you go, when comes up Flynn going to the big bar and all these big nameless brutes right. are there, but then you'll find out they have hobbies like he likes making things, he plays the piano. Right, they, they kind of make fun of the trope a little bit in Tangled with that, um, but yeah, yeah. I like the characters more. Yeah, you like the characters more. Um, and it doesn't have to necessarily even be a direct contrast um, to, to who they are, but something. 